Now, last time we met, we had a really brief introduction to tensors at the end of the dual vector section. And I gave you two definitions of uh, tensors. You can pick either one, but you got to tell me one of them. Louis. Louis. I'm here. Louis, can you give me one of the two definitions of tensors? I Either do one. Because I missed the last 15 minutes of class. Oh that, boy, that well, Joel is going to help you out. Joel, give me a definition of a tensor. Oh, it's a um, multilinear map from the space of vectors to um, zero numbers or complex numbers. <laughs> uh, multilinear map from the space of vectors and dual vectors into the real numbers or complex numbers. Uh, Andrew, give me the other definition. Transform, a tensor transforms like a tensor. Exactly, a tensor transforms like a tensor. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we are going to take all of the hard work that we put into vectors and dual vectors, and we're gonna watch it pay off. Because a tensor, if you think about it, is just an object that has indices which either are vector-like or dual vector-like. So if I ask you, how do you transform a tensor, it turns out that as long as you know how to transform a vector index and how to transform a dual vector index, the game is won. So let me show you what I'm talking about. So for the transformation decided by index structure, we have the following. First of all, I am not going to include the basis vectors or dual vectors in this discussion. We're going to forgo talking about those altogether. So we're only going to talk about components. And we can do all of our work in terms of components. And then if we want to put back in the basis, dual vectors and vectors, everything will work out. So we'll just leave those out. This, of course, means that most things transform except the scalar. If I transform the coordinates, a scalar goes to from C to C prime, C prime is exactly equal to C. That is, the scalar has no components that need to be transformed. A vector under the transformation goes to V mu prime. So what I have in mind is that I'm going from the C, T, X, Y, Z coordinate system to the C, T prime, X prime, Y prime, Z prime coordinate system. So that's the coordinate change, which underlies everything I'm writing. And you should be comfortable with the idea where, of course, this can be encoded in a matrix, lambda mu prime mu. And the transformation of the components of a vector is just the application of this transformation matrix. Okay. For a dual vector, the components of a dual vector, I'm always going to be talking about components, so I'll say it a few times and then we'll just call them vectors and dual vectors. The components of the dual vector transform as lambda mu mu prime omega mu. Okay? So these are the simplest tensors. They're a scalar, a vector, and a dual vector. The next simplest tensors have two indices, but it turns out that they come in three varieties. I'm a poet, I know it because I rhyme on a tone. Anyway, uh, so first, we can have our tensor have two vector indices. Then we can have our tensor have one vector and one dual vector index. And then finally, and I'm going to pick a different thing, TH, I'll call it M. Then we can have our tensor have two dual vector indices. Okay? So if it's a second rank tensor, these are the three possibilities. Of course, this is what we would call a 2, 0. This is what we would call a 1, 1. And this is what we would call a 0, 2. This is what we call a 0, 1. This is what we call a 1, 0. And this is what we call a 0, 0. We're not going to really stick with this 2010 naming convention because these are the symbols we're going to put to our equations. So if you look at H, upper mu, lower mu, it's obvious that's a 1 1 tensor. So we don't have to write down all this extra labeling. But nonetheless, here is the very good news. 
T mu nu goes to T nu prime nu prime, where all I have to do is transform each of these indices with their own transformation matrix. So literally, if you covered up the new part of this story, <laughs> trying to do that, you, well, how would that transform? Give me a taker. Laura, answer me. Yeah, so I would say lambda mu prime mu t mu. Now, what if I did the mu part of the story? You would do the same thing. I'd do the same damn thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> See how easy this is? Pretty dang easy. All right. So, Sean. Sean. Why don't you tell me how I should transform this guy? Well, I'm looking better than a dual vector. Exactamondo. So we're going to have lambda mu prime mu, lambda mu mu prime h mu mu. Okay. And then I won't even ask anyone this one. Hopefully, it's obvious to you. That is my transformation law for the various second rank tensors, okay, of which there are three, of course. Now I'm just going to take a moment to reconnect this to matrix multiplication because it's a little bit separated from matrix multiplication. We're not going to do a lot of matrix multiplication in this class unless you want to use it as a tool in your homework. It's the main, the main reason I'm about to show this to you. But I won't do this very often, but I'm going to do it for you now. So if we want, so first of all, t mu nu, h mu nu, and m mu nu, if you wrote each of these as a matrix, what would it look like? I mean, it's a matrix. We're in four dimensions. How big do you think it is? Four by four matrix. It's a four by four matrix. However, what I want you to realize is that if I gave you a four by four matrix, That is not telling you what kind of tensor it is. Because it could be any of these three. Like, if I gave you a vector, then it's obvious it's a vector. OK? But if you're doing a two by two matrix, it's not obvious. Is it two upper, two lower, one upper, one lower? Who knows? OK? So now. Remember, you can move things around as much as you want. But in order to replace things with matrices, first of all, each of these is going to be a matrix, because this has got two indices, this has got two indices, this has got two indices, matrix times matrix times matrix. However, you've got to get things in the right order. And you have to make sure that you have the summed over indices immediately adjacent. OK? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take this to be the defining transformation. We're going to call this lambda. All right? Now, taking lambda as the defined transformation, we can figure out what we need in order to do the rest of these. So for example, at some point, we're going to need to know what that is. Okay, that's obviously important. It's there, it's there, it's there. Okay, how is this related to lambda? It's lambda inverse, exactly. Hopefully you remember that the different ways that a vector and a dual vector, their components transform is, they transform as inverses of each other. That's why a vector eating a dual vector gives you an invariant. Okay, excellent. Now we also, okay, so hold on. So if I try and do this, then I can move this next to the t mu nu, so the mu's are right next to each other. But then this lambda nu prime crap sits over here. And I really need that nu to be right there. So what I need is I need to know what is 
that in relation to that? Any takers? It's the transpose. All you're doing is taking the right and the left and you're swapping them. So this would be lambda transpose. Okay? Uh, let me think. Do, do, do. Do, do, do. This is going to be lambda mu, mu prime, m mu nu, lambda nu, nu prime. The nu's are right next to each other, but we're going to have to get this swapped. So what is this going to be equal to? Yes, lambda inverse transpose. Okay? So at the end of the day, I can take this and I can say that this is lambda times the matrix T times the matrix lambda transpose. Okay? I can say that uh, this one is lambda times H times lambda inverse transpose. And then I can say that this one is lambda inverse transpose times M times lambda inverse. Okay, so all I'm saying is if I gave you the matrix, a four by four matrix, and I said it's a two zero or a one one or a two zero two, I gave you a single transformation matrix lambda. In order to figure out how that matrix transforms, you do these matrix multiplications. Okay, that's, that's the way it plays out. It's not pretty, but it's not that ugly. Any questions? Okay, now, um, and obviously you can now continue this story to you know, a tensor of your wildest dreams. Okay? Just pick a tensor with any number of indices. All you do is transform each index, whether it's a vector or dual vector index. So it's nothing tricky. comfortable with the idea of tensors. Okay, well, we'll get this hands up. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk about a few special tensors. So, there are many tensors out there. First of all, there's this one. What kind of tensor is this? Oh, hold on, I'm going to draw a name. Kiana, are you on the Zoom meeting? Or Kiana's not here, is she? Are you on Zoom? Yeah, I'm on the Zoom meeting. I'm yes. Zoom hey, what kind of tensor is that? Um, is that just like a, a one one? Is that what you're saying? All right. Anybody want to help her out? It's not a one one tensor. It's a. Oh, got some silence in the room. Come on. It's a. No, Ross, I talked to you today. No. <laughs> Come on, folks. What kind of tensor is that? Is it a tensor? No. It's not a tensor. That's the point of the question. This is the one matrix in this class which is not a tensor. Remember, tensors will always have either unprimed or primed indices. You evaluate it in one coordinate system. This always has one prime and one unprimed index because it's taking you from this coordinate system to this coordinate system. This is a transformation. It can be represented by a matrix, which looks a hell of a lot like a tensor, but it ain't no tensor, okay? So this is not a special tensor. It's not a tensor at all, period, done. Any questions? Huh? I said that was a trick question. <laughs> yes, it was, it was, and I'm sorry to have put that up on you. But, let's continue. Now, a truly special tensor is the metric tensor, which uh, takes an upper, upper index into a lower one. 
or I could say it takes a, an element, a vector index from the tangent space and puts it into the cotangent space, because that's where the vectors and dual vectors live. Uh, so for example, if I hit, uh, oh sorry, if I hit the tensor T nu, which is just a vector with the metric A to mu nu, I get the tensor T mu, okay? And this tensor, okay, takes lower index into a higher. Now, um, it's a very, very important observation that I want to make right now, and that is the following. Notice, because this has two lower indices, it grabs this one and it pulls it down. Now, truthfully, I can do that with any tensor. What kind of object is this going to end up being? Ignore the summed over index because it's just going to disappear. So it's going to be a a dual vector, right? So why don't I call this T mu? I would not call that T mu because this is an entirely new object. Okay, it is only when you raise or lower indices with the metric that you use the same symbol for the before and after, because if this is a vector, this is the corresponding dual vector. If this is a dual vector, this is the corresponding vector. These, there's a unique map between vectors and dual vectors in tangent space and cotangent space, and the metric is what maps between them, okay? It is true that in terms of this index gymnastics that a, any lower, to, uh, zero two tensor can lower an index, it's just there's not going to be any special relationship between T and G. It's just going to be a new object. Okay, so we want to be clear about that. If you're lowering an index with, with an arbitrary matrix, just give this a new name. Don't keep the name T. But do it if you're using the metric. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, the metric has some nice properties. For example, the metric, and this will turn out to be true in general, but it's obviously true for this metric, the metric is symmetric under the exchange of its indices. This is obvious for the metric as we've written it because it's diagonal. And if you have a diagonal matrix, you can flip the indices and it doesn't change anything. Okay? The metric, With lower indices and upper indices, well, that's the inverse metric. If this is the metric, this is the inverse metric because you combine them together and you get a delta function, which is basically the identity. That would not be the case in general if I took a tensor with two upper indices and the same tensor with two lower indices, that's not going to combine to give me the identity. This is just going to combine to give me a number. Or sorry, no, 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 sorry, sorry, a tensor. Okay, but a different tensor. So the metric has some nice properties. Okay? This is obviously true for the metric in special relativity, but it will turn out to be true for any metric we use in this course, even in curved space. This will be true for any metric we use in this course, even in curved space. This might be obvious for the one we use in special relativity. It is not so obvious. In fact, I will say it is deceptive because in special relativity, this matrix is the same as this matrix, so you don't really care. In general relativity on a curved space, this matrix looks very different from this matrix, so you have to know which one you're using when you plug in matrices, okay? That's why we call this with two lower indices the metric and this the inverse metric 
even though in special relativity they have the same values. Okay? But again, you know, they're four by four matrices, but as tensors, they behave very differently. This is a two zero tensor, and this is a zero two tensor. Okay, they just look the same as matrices. Okay. Um, okay, so one more quick thing, and then we'll get going. Um, what do you think? That is. Let me take a volunteer. Gus. 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 <sighs> Lauren. What do you think that is? Well, what kind of object is it? Well, because they're, they're not, one's symmetric, but it's also not quite the, it's, a, it's not quite the inverse symmetric, is it? No, well, okay. No, this is, this is not the inverse of this. Yeah. I mean, it is. But it's like not. Yeah, so what, what operation am I doing up there? That's my question. You can phone a friend if you need to. Yeah, well, I'd like to phone a friend. Josh, you gonna help her out? Could it be a scalar? Oh! Ho oh, ho! It could be a scalar, but what scalar? What scalar? Uh, a good one. Uh, let's go with C squared. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a good guess. That is a good guess. Mm, good guess. No takers? Yeah. Four. Four. Oh. Oh. What did you do? Uh, trace. You traced it. So you actually saw this in your last homework. One way that you can do this is you can write this as a matrix multiplication, and then you can just throw on a delta function to turn the alpha back into a mu at the end. Now you take this and multiply it by this, that's the identity. And then this is just saying sum over the elements of the diagonal elements of the identity, which gives you four. I want to point this out because if I said trace the metric, or remember if we write the metric, it looks like that. A common answer I get is two. But that's not the trace of the metric. The trace of the metric is given by this, and it's four. Okay? We all on board? All right. So now, let's make an observation. We know that the coordinates, x mu, transform like vector components. Okay. In fact, that's how we figured out uh, how the vector components transform. We said we know how the coordinates transform, a vector is invariant, therefore we figured out how the basis transforms, and then we said a vector uses the same basis. So if the basis transforms in this way, the vector components have to transform the same as x mu. The question now is, what about the derivative with respect to x mu? Well, let's, let's, let's pose an argument. First of all, if I take the derivative of x nu, notice that's mu and nu, what does this give me? Is it the direct delta? It gives me the direct delta. Or the parameter? Where are the indices? Right, so the mu is lower, the mu is upper, okay? This is a scalar. This is special, okay? 
The Dirac delta function is special because of its definition. It's just saying if the two indices are the same, it's one. And if the two indices are not the same, it's zero. And that doesn't care what coordinate system you're in. So this one's weird. This is an index scalar. We won't use it much. We'll just use it in proofs like this. But the important point is, if this thing transforms like a vector, and the combination of this and this gives me a scalar, what must this transform like? A dual vector. A dual vector, exactamondo. So we will utilize the notation that dx d, or d by dx mu, is d mu. That is, we will give it a dual vector index because it transforms like a dual vector. Okay? That is for special relativity. That will not be the case in curved space. In fact, that will play a critical role in our extension of things to curved space. Okay? But there you go. There is a very naturally occurring dual vector. Now let's consider some tensor equations to see where these things might pop up in physics. <clears throat> so, um, so first of all, the physical world has no preordained coordinate system. Okay, there's no coordinates that are living out there. You can go look for them, get a flashlight, look in the dark, you won't find them, okay? So um, honestly, truly fundamental laws of physics should be invariant under coordinate changes, okay? In order for our mathematical descriptions of laws of physics to be invariant under coordinate changes means they need to be built out of tensors. Because remember, one of the defining aspects of tensors is they are invariant. The coordinates change, but the full tensor is invariant, okay? Now, how can we see if a tensor equation is invariant? And what I mean by that is as follows. First of all, if my equation is in terms of scalars, then the invariance of this equation is obvious. Because if I transform everything in this equation, I get a prime equals b prime, but these are scalars, so this is equal to a, this is equal to b, they're equal to each other, so they're equal to each other. Well, that's the sum first of the equation that I wrote. Okay, so the scalar case is trivial. Fortunately, Equations can transform. F equals ma. It's a vector equation. It transforms under rotations. Okay? So we can investigate how and when an equation transforms in the correct manner to encode an invariant. Because if we put back in the basis vectors and dual vectors, then the entire thing would be invariant. So let me give you an example. So if I took a mu nu, being equal to b mu, c nu, alpha, d alpha. And I asked, how does this transform? Well, here's our answer. First of all, it goes to a, mu prime, nu prime, everything gets a prime. And now all we do is we write each and every primed index in terms of the original indices, but with the transformation matrices. So here we go. We're going to have lambda. And just let me write what I wrote on my sheet. Okay, that's the transformation of a mu nu. Then I just transform each of these indices one at a time. So we're going to have lambda mu prime mu b mu, uh, let me see, lambda nu prime nu, and then I'm going to need a transformation for the lower index, so we'll have lambda uh, alpha, alpha prime, c nu alpha, okay, and then we got to 
that's from the D alpha. Lambda uh, alpha prime alpha D alpha. There we go. Okay, everybody on board? Nice. Now remember, we can move things around as much as we want in index notation. In particular, I can write this as lambda mu prime mu D mu. Uh, actually, let me just move this over. Lambda mu prime mu D mu. And then this is, oh, wait a minute. Lambda alpha alpha prime, lambda alpha prime alpha. Oh, no, wait, hold on, I don't want to do that. Why did I do that? Any takers? Because that one just gets summed out um, as a scalar, so you can change that to any sort of indices you want. Well, actually, I don't want it to be the same as these indices, because the summation convention applied to four repeated indices says give this value 0, 0, 0, 0, plus 1, 1, 1, 1, plus 2. But that's not the way this is supposed to be evaluated. This is 0, 0, plus 1, 1, times 0, 0, times. So you've got to give it a different index if you're summing over. So you always want to do your summations in pairs. Okay? But nonetheless, what is this? No takers? With, this, with two unprimed indices? Yeah. Well, a lambda shouldn't have two unprimed indices. It was written right here. Uh, Can you see it through the vague, the ratio marks? Oh, uh, they're inverses. So they're inverses, delta. so what's it equal to? Delta. It's equal to the identity, basically. Yeah, it's delta, alpha, gamma. But all that says is take this gamma and make it an alpha and then delete me. Well, hold on. Here's what I started with. The transformation on the left-hand side uses these two gamma matrices and so does the right. See that? This is going to be guaranteed as long as your indices work out. If the indices, if the, if the net indices, I should say, if the net indices on the left, which is upper mu nu, is the same as the net indices on the right, which is upper mu nu, because the alpha sum over, these two sides of the equation are going to ultimately transform in the same way. But that's good. Because this is physics, and this is just changing the coordinate system. It shouldn't take something which is true physically and make it untrue. <laughs> it's still true. Does that make sense? Does that make, this is something we're going to use extensively in curve spaces where it's a, it's a more formidable question, formidable question to answer. So does this make sense? What we find is that if we construct a Lagrangian that's this invariant, the equations of motion transform, but the, each side of the equation transforms in the same way. We call this covariance. Okay? Which is slightly different than invariance. Invariance says it's like this. Nothing happens. Covariance says the same thing happens on each side. Okay, we good? Okay. Um, all right, now uh, one more thing that I'll mention, uh, and then we'll press on. Uh, if I'm defining tensor.
sensors, I have to be a bit careful, and we'll see this in a minute, that the index structure symmetries must be the same on each side. So this is a quantity which is inversely related if I switch the two indices. Okay, don't worry about how this is defined, but it's, if I swap the two indices, I get an overall minus sign. And clearly that's the same here. Okay, so the index symmetry on each side of an equal sign must be the same. Otherwise it doesn't make sense because if you swap the indices on one side and swap them on the other and you get different results, it's no longer equal. Okay? All right, now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to really touch base with some physics that you are familiar with. And this will be something that some of you have seen, some of you have not seen, but you will all appreciate, I think is the right word, but I think it might also be replaced with hate. <laughs> but at any rate, let's consider Maxwell's equations. slightly different way than you've seen, and that's okay. All right, now first and foremost, what you should know about electromagnetism is that at least the Maxwell equation part of it, is relativistically invariant. Okay? It doesn't really look like it because you've got spatial derivatives and then you've got time derivatives and hell, this is next thing, the spatial derivative of B with the time derivative of E, how the hell is that gonna work out? Is it gonna be a four vector? No. Okay, it turns out it works out. Just doesn't use a four vector. Well, it uses a four vector, but it's not the four vector that you're thinking of. Okay? So, first of all, let's count the equations that we are focused on. How many equations does this represent? Well, so when I count equations, what I mean is how many independent equations does that expression? give you if you break it up into its coordinates. Three, I heard you say three. Because it's, it's in terms of vectors. So this gives me three equations. How about this one? One, okay? It's built out of vectors, but it's, it's, it's a scalar co combination of del and, and E, so it's just one equation. What about this one? Three, and the last one? One, okay? Now, as I think I mentioned before, these are the equations of motion. These are the results of the Bianchi identity. But nonetheless, I'm going to do some very, very sophisticated mathematics with you right now. So buckle your seat belts and keep your eyes on the board, because if you take your eyes off the board, you're going to lose what I'm about to do. Are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we have eight different equations. Okay, that's, that's what I mean. All right? And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to relativize this in a very obvious way. Okay? So to relativize it, first we introduce a vector called J mu. A vector in relativistic scenarios is a four component object. What can we take from these equations and combine them to make a four component object? First order, second order. Say it again? First order, second order. Well, that's actually true, but those are equations, those aren't objects. Danny, are you here, Danny? Danny, are you online? Danny's not here. I've already asked Liam a question. Oh, my goodness. Annabelle. What in this set of equations 
could we combine to make a four component object? Just not say the equations themselves that are going out. Well, this, no, this is equations that relate B, E, J, and rho. And then they're derivatives, but they're derivatives and not important. Do you think the answer? Say it again? Do you think the answer is B equivalent? The answer is like the. Yeah, this is a three component vector. This is a scalar. So together, those make a four component object. And I might put the row as the time life piece, and then the j as the xyz piece, because j is a vector at xyz. Okay? That works out perfectly. Okay? Yes? Is there a reason rho has to be the time life piece? Yes, because j is a space like vector, and it has to go in the xyz parts. Okay? I mean, it works out this way, trust me. <laughs> yes? Why is rho time like that? What do you mean, why is rho time like? If j is a space vector, then why is rho a time vector, or a time scalar? Because you've, you've taken the four dimensional invariance, which is obvious, and you've broken it down into obvious three dimensional rotations. This isn't very under boosts, but it's kind of complicated. I'm about to make it incredibly obviously invariant under boosts. The first thing I have to do is create a four vector. Because I can't leave a three vector in the story. I can't leave this. I can't leave this because it turns out this isn't a scalar under boosts. It's a scalar under rotations, but not boosts. That's not obvious, but it turns out to be true. Okay? So this is a four component vector. That's a good part of the story. That transforms in a really well defined way. Here's the hard question What the hell are we going to do with E and B? Where's the fourth component of E? Where's the fourth component of B? Huh? Huh? Yeah. Okay. Well, it turns out that to include E and B in a relativistic story, we have to introduce a zero to tensor. And this zero to tensor is called the field strength tensor. It's that F mu nu I wrote earlier. In terms of the components of E and B, it takes the following form. Oh boy. This is anti-symmetric. If you flip it around the diagonal, it comes back to minus itself. So minus E3 goes there, up to E3. Okay? Now, we have all of the information in these, or all of the ingredients in these equations. The rho and j form a four vector. The E and B form a zero two tensor. Now all we have to do is write down the equations using these, and the equations take the following form. Two is the correct answer to that question. Now, uh, these are complicated equations, but two is better than four. Yes? The square brackets. I'll tell you about that in just a moment. Okay. So let us first reassure ourselves that we have eight individual equations here. Because at the end of the day, this is a set of equations, just like this. So first of all, let's look at the first one. How many equations does the first one represent? Why three? This one? Yeah. Well, hold on. I'm saying all of this is contained in two equations. 
Secondly, what does each side of this equation transform like? A vector, which has how many components? Four. So this is four expressions. It's a vector equals a vector. That means each component is equal to the other, the component of the other vector. So that's four equations now that we're working in four dimensions. Okay? So this has got four. Ooh, what about this one? And I can say that these four equations come from picking the value of nu to be either 0, 1, 2, or 3. Well, first of all, how many do we need to get from this? Four. Because as many equations as we have here, we should also have here. We've gotten four, we need four more. This has three indices. This can take four values, this can take four values, this can take four values. How many components does this thing have? Can I answer? No. Yeah, you can answer, Ross. 64. 64. Okay. So there's got to be something here which is getting rid of 60 of those. It turns out it's the square brackets. The square brackets are basically saying anti-symmetrize this thing under any assignment of the indices. Okay? Now, the very first thing we should observe is that if we ever anti symmetrize anything, and by the way, anti symmetrization is simply, you know, if you have a B mu nu, then this is one half B mu nu minus one half B mu nu. That's what I mean by anti symmetrize. Okay? So F mu nu is already anti symmetrized, but I can take an arbitrary tensor and I can anti symmetrize the indices just by this construction. And then you can do it with three indices, four indices, however many you want. Now here's the important observation. What is this? Yeah. It's zero. I mean, it's B11 minus B11. <coughs> In fact, when you anti symmetrize the indices, any time you pick the indices and two of them are the same, it's zero. Well, if the left-hand side is automatically zero, it obviously satisfies the equation, so there's no information there. What you need is for the left-hand side to be non-zero, and then saying that it's equal to zero gives you an equation you can use. Does that make sense? So it's like if I say, you know, A plus B equals zero, that tells you something, but if I write this down, that doesn't tell you very much. So any version of this, where two of the indices are repeated, this is automatically zero, it has no information. But that means that we have to pick out of four options, three distinct choices. Now, do you think the order matters? The order doesn't matter because we're totally anti-symmetrizing among switching indices. So it turns out that there are one, two, three, which two? And zero, two, three. There are four possibilities. So we get four equations from this, and that cre recreates the information in the second set. Now, it might just look for a moment. This has the J nu on the right hand side. The J nu is rho and J, so clearly it contains the information from these two. This has zero, clearly it contains the information from these two. Okay? Well, guess what? I will now ask you are these equations invariant under boosts? Hell yes. They are written in terms of four component vectors. This zero, three component tensor. They're built out of four component or four dimensional objects, which are tensors, therefore they are invariant under boosts. 
That is much harder to prove in this three-dimensional breakdown. Okay? I thought you said rho wasn't invariant under this. Sorry, say it again? I thought you said rho wasn't invariant under this. Rho is, rho is not invariant under a boost. Oh, but the whole equation is. Yes, the oh. whole equation is. Well, so let me, let me go back. The equation is not invariant under a boost. It rather, okay, this is an equation written only in terms of components. Therefore, the left-hand side transforms exactly like the right-hand side, so this is covariant. If I were to write it in terms of the basis vectors and dual vectors in conjunction with these components, both sides would be invariant. So there's, there's levels of invariance and covariance. We're only going to work with the components, so the best we can look for is covariance. But both sides of this is covariant. Okay? All right. Oh, we're doing pretty good. So let's, uh, so that's electromagnetism. That's kind of a, a complicated story, but one of the themes of it is that to go from the non-relativistic version to the relativistic version, we have to get anything that's like a three-component vector and give it a time-like piece to make a four-component vector. Or we can take vector components and combine them into tensor components. All right? Now, this is an exceptional part of the story. We're not often going to encounter this. But what we're rather going to do now is turn our attention to the relativistic formulation of more familiar physics. That is kinematics and dynamics. And this is unfortunately going to involve some interesting steps. But let's begin with the simple observation that in 3D kinematics, we start our story off with the position as a function of time where we can be talking about the components of the position. So xi would put the values x1, x2, x3, and as you move, your position varies with time. And then we can define from that the components of the velocity as the derivatives of the components of the position with respect to time. And then we can take that and we can introduce the notion of the acceleration which is the derivative of the components of the velocity with respect to time, okay? For 3D dynamics, we have that the sum of the forces, okay, maybe as a function of time, is equal to the mass of the system times the acceleration as a function of time, which we can also cleverly write as the time derivative of the components of the momentum, okay? Where, of course, the momentum in this story is just defined as m times vi. Okay, so in all of this, i just takes the value 1, 2, 3, or x, y, z. Okay? Well, where do we want to take this? dimension. Components of a vector, components of a vector, components of a vector, components of a vector, components of a vector. Damn, kill a lot of vectors. I have to add time-like components to all these. <laughs> okay, let's try that. Let's see what we can do. So, um, first of all, in 4D, we can imagine that the coordinates or the coordinate vector is simply replaced by the four component vector, okay? Where mu takes the value zero, one, two, three. How many of you think that's actually correct? I'm the only one that got it right. It's correct. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is, X, Y, Z, and in four dimensions, it's T, X, Y, Z. I'm setting C equal to one. Or maybe I'll set C equal to one. Okay? okay? So yeah, this is a natural generalization of position in three space to position in four space. You just add on that fourth coordinate. Hold on. 
I just generalize that, I think I can generalize this. Vi goes to u mu. Uh, two questions. What is u zero? What is that? I mean, it's obvious, like what x i to x mu became because we took three x y z, we added on t and got t x y z. Uh, what do we do with v x v y z z? Uh, okay, hold on. So maybe, maybe we'll try um, u mu is equal to dx mu dt. See how easy this is? Ross, Ross, don't steal my thunder, please. Please don't steal my thunder. Okay. This looks like a pretty simple generalization, right? I mean, we're just doing what we did here. All right? There's a problem with it. Can anybody accept Ross spot the problem? Or did you hear Ross? Anyone on Zoom other than Ross? Ross, I know you know the answer to this. Yes? Well, I mean, our T component is going to be like a constant. That's going to look kind of dumb. Our T component is going to be a constant. Well, yeah, T with respect to T is hopefully going to be a constant. Well, let me actually ask you. Is this a vector? Is x mu a vector? Yes, it is. It's the very first vector we studied. <laughs> the, it's a coordinate vector. It's a position vector, if you will. But the difference, the dx mu, is the components of a displacement vector, which is well-defined. But this is definitely a vector. We want this to be a four component vector, but my question is, is this definition a four component vector? Wouldn't you kind of want to do what you probably never tried before? Um, no, I mean, yeah, don't, don't look at this. This is not gonna help you. This, this will actually mislead you. Okay, so hold on. So here's what we want to do. T in this expression parametrizes the motion. So you can say, I'm moving, and this is my position at t equals zero, this is my position at t equals one, this is my position at t equals 374,000. T just lets you track the motion through space. Now our position is a position in space and time. So, ah, hell, this just use the same definition. I mean, you know, this is how we define velocity here. We just said it's derivative of position with respect to time. Let's try the same definition. Does this work? No. It doesn't work because this is not a vector. Why is that not a vector? What is dx mu? Anyone? It's a vector. What is dt? T is the component of a vector. This transforms. It doesn't transform like a vector. It transforms as the component of a vector. So I'm taking a vector and I'm dividing it by something which transforms as the component of a vector. Do you think that combination is a vector? Hell no. It's not a vector. Everybody on board? We cannot just take the derivative of your position in space-time with respect to time, because time is not an invariant. It is in this case, because this uses Galilean relativity, where time is absolute. Everyone agrees on time. There's no transformation you can do that changes time. 
This is a vector because this is a vector and this is a scalar in Galilean relativity. We're not doing Galilean relativity anymore. Time is a component of a four vector. This is a four vector, this is not a vector. We need to divide this by something which is a scalar. Say it again. So, so the speed of light? Yeah. Well, the speed of light is just a number. We need something which can increase so that we can track the motion as this thing increases. So we want to parameterize your position in space time by some increasing quantity. So here's my question. So it's, it's weird, it's hard, but we can do it. You know, there's x, there's y, there's t, and there's z. And as a particle moves, it actually traces a line in space-time. Okay, a particle forms a line in space-time. It's a particle in space, but in space-time, it forms a line. Does that make sense? Is there anything about this line that you might imagine you could use to parameterize the motion. We used T here. T is just this internal clock that's ticking. While you move through space, here we're moving through space-time, but we would really love to say, I'm here, and later I'm there, and later I'm there, and later I'm there, but you can't use T. So what could you use? The length. The length. Who said it? Liam. Excellent answer. You can use the length of the pack. Make sense? That's the correct answer, but it's going to carry with it some weird consequences. So buckle your seatbelts. Okay? So what we're going to do is we are going to use the length of the line and we might say the length of the line is the integral of the square root of ds squared. That way, if it's not a straight line, we'll just integrate over it as it changes. Okay? Where ds squared, in case you don't remember, is minus c squared dt squared plus dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. If this were a straight line, then I could just talk about delta and not differential. But what we're doing is we're taking this path and we're breaking it up into tiny straight segments. Which, if these are infinitesimally small, you can approximate any path with tiny straight segments. The straight segments have like d, t, d, x, d, y, d, d. Okay? So this is the length squared of one of them, and then we take the square root to make it of distance meters. And then we integrate over all of them. Okay? Would that work? Does that work? Does this definition work? I mean, has it, this is, hopefully you see this is like the integral of ds. <laughs> S is the integral of ds. That's what this secretly says. You know, it's just the square root of ds squared. Any issues? Turns out it won't work. What is the length if you're moving slower than the speed of light? Which most things are. Actually, let's just take the simplest case. Um, v equals zero. Obviously less than c. What is dx, dy, dz when v is zero? Mm -hmm. What is dt? Zero. D, say it again? We don't know. Yeah, dt is just some positive number. But what's ds squared? Positive or negative? It's negative. Okay. So what we're going to do to fix our definition is we're going to do the square root of the magnitude where you 
must bear in mind, even though this says bs squared, bs squared can come out to be positive, negative, or zero, depending on how fast you're moving. When is it zero? When the velocity equals, when the speed equals c. Okay? And it's positive if the speed is greater than c. Now we won't worry about that, but we obviously want something which works for the speed being c or the speed being less than c. And so this magnitude will work. Okay? So now, oh wait a minute. If I'm at rest, this takes a special value. If I'm at rest, then S is the integral of the square root of C of C of C of minus to C D E. So if I am at rest, and the length is the integral of what we call the rest time. That is, it's the time that elapses in the reference frame which is at rest with respect to the thing that you're trying to describe. Okay? So what we can do is we can call this tau, or the rest time, tau, the rest time, it doesn't matter. But here's the very interesting thing. This, in the rest frame, looks like this. In an arbitrary frame, looks like this. But this is invariant. This is the, this is the square of a vector. Or it's the, it's, sorry, it's the vector combined with the vector. So whatever value you might get in the rest frame is the same value you get in any other frame. But think about it. This thing is just the length of this. Why, why should it matter what coordinate system you're using? The length of this is an invariant. Is that the mysterious proper time? Yes, it's also called the proper time. OK? Is everybody on board with that? Now, um, before we if I define u mu as dx mu d tau, I think I have a vector. Because this is a vector, this is a scalar, it's invariant. to show you one very, very confusing aspect of this, and that is the size of it. U mu, U mu equals, what do you think? That's the velocity squared. What do you think? It's the velocity vector and the velocity dual vector, sorry, combined to form an invariant. What do you think? C squared. Say it again? C squared. C squared? This is not moving at speed of light. It sure feels like it is. No. <laughs> no. I mean, maybe if it was traveling at speed of light, I don't know. But this, is not, this doesn't have to be traveling at speed of light. So what's that equal to? Strangely enough, this is equal to minus 1. Let me show you. First of all, we can construct this from two vectors using the method. Okay? Because we just want a dual vector, so we use the metric to take a vector and turn it into a dual vector. Okay? Now let's put in the definitions for u mu and u nu.
the tau squared. Oh, sorry. Hold on. Pause. I gotta. I gotta correct something. Oh yeah. Sorry. Somebody needed to yell at me. Uh, Sorry about this. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, tau C to be tau to be the integral of C D T. Okay, yeah, I'll have to hunt this down. But nonetheless, V tau squared is just going to become minus a to mu nu dx mu dx nu. Which obviously gives me minus one. Now it might seem weird that the square of the four velocity gives you a constant. I mean, this is a constant. This is the number one. This is not speed squared or anything like that. But if you think about it, the reason why the square of this gives you the speed squared has got a lot to do with that you're parameterizing the motion by a quantity which is not at all related to the dx mu or the dx i's. However, here, we're parameterizing the motion by the distance that it's traveled. So for example, if you in three dimensions decided to define the velocity in terms of this weird vector, where instead of t, you used the distance traveled, which is also a good parameterization of motion, then clearly v dot v equals 1. Because dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared is equal to ds squared. So you get 1 over 1. Or you get ds squared over ds squared, which is 1. OK? Now, uh, actually, I'm going to finish there. I was going to talk about the different components of mu, or of u0, but then we'll have to turn to p, the momentum. And so this is probably a good enough place to stop. Are there any questions before we disband? All right, remember, I'm going to add a couple more problems to your homework. This homework set should be la smaller in total than the last one. The last one covered three lectures. This one only covers two. So probably be about four questions total, maybe five, all right? But I'll add the two, the, the rest of them in tonight. And then you can come to my office hours tomorrow, or you can Zoom to my office hours tomorrow from 3.30 to 7, or to Madison's from 3 to 5 on Thursday. Joel. Joel. Josh. Good.